Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs and their leadership teams get what they want out of business and life. On the show, I invite successful business owners and expert speakers to share their successes. They are open and honest about the highs and lows of business and also life as a business owner. We want to share those learnings with you to inspire you, but also to help you avoid some of the common mistakes. My hope is that you take something from each of these short episodes that you can put into action to help you get what you want, not only out of your business, but also your life. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am coming to you pre-recorded. I've been pre-recording these sessions because I'm currently away for around five weeks, a mixture of business and pleasure. First couple of weeks in the South Island in the camper van and then I'm off to Sydney for a couple of conferences. So today I'm going to be talking to you about what the heck is EOS. So this whole podcast was set up to share a thing called the EOS Life, which is about doing what you love with people you love, making a huge difference being compensated appropriately with time to pursue other passions. And that is what attracted me to the EOS system, which is the entrepreneurial operating system. And today I'm just going to give a quick overview of what that system is all about. So if you're joining us for the first time, my name is Deborah. I am the host of this podcast, as well as being a professional EOS implementer. I normally talk to other business owners about their business life and what is going on for them and the things they've been through. They share the highs and the lows of their journey. I myself am an entrepreneur and I too have run several businesses, up to a couple of hundred staff, a couple really, really successfully and a couple pretty miserably. So I have learned from the good and the bad and I'm going to share some of these experiences. I share it in my EOS practice. I'm going to share it as I take you through a journey of what the heck is EOS today. So let's get started. I'd like to start this with a a favorite quote of mine, and it's from Jim Collins, of course, the author of Good to Great and many other books as well, but that's the the one that, um, I guess, shot him to his fame. And he says, magic occurs when you combine a spirit of entrepreneurialism with a culture of discipline. And this is what EOS is all about. So it's called the Entrepreneurial Operating System for good reason. It's designed to help entrepreneurs bring a little bit of discipline into their business. Not too much because we know that we don't want to be hampered. We don't want to get rid of that entrepreneurial spirit. But we also know that it's really important for the team to have a structure, some discipline, accountability, so they can actually achieve their goals. So what is EOS? We'll start with that. So the Entrepreneurial Operating System, it's a complete set of simple concepts and practical tools that will help you better prepare for obstacles and opportunities, solve issues at the root, and gain more traction in your company. It has been used by over 120,000 businesses around the world, and there are about 500 accredited EOS implementers that can actually help you um, to implement it into your business. At its core, it will achieve three main things. So the first one is it will help you with your vision. And we're not saying that the vision doesn't exist. We know it exists in your brain, in the brains of your leadership team. What we need to do is extract that and get everyone in your organization 100% on the same page with where you're going, how you plan to get there, and how they fit into their plan and what their role is in terms of that. So we want to extract that information, get it out there and make sure everybody understands not only what the vision is, but what part they play in it. The second part is around traction. And this is where we look to instill focus, discipline and accountability throughout the entire company so that everyone executes on that vision every single day. And this really is about, you know, I think uh, Gino says vision without traction is hallucination. You can have the best plans in the world to where you're headed, but unless you can actually bring it down to the ground and make sure people understand and are held accountable and have that discipline to actually achieve that vision, then really it, it, it is worth nothing. And finally, the third part is about healthy. And this, um, this comes from A lot of the work that Patrick Lencioni has done, one of my favorite, I'm a fan girl of Patrick, he always talks about, you know, how do you make sure that your team is cohesive, functional and healthy? And the work that we do in EOS is around making sure that you actually, as a leadership team, you're having those difficult conversations. You're working together for the greater good. You're getting to understand each other. You're not afraid of conflict because you know that that's for the greater good of the organization, but you have some fun along the way too. 
So that's pretty much what EOS is all about. Um, and I suppose if you think about, you know, why would I want to bring this into my business? It, it helps you to work more effectively with less frustration, have a clearer understanding of the connection between your team's efforts and the success of your company. It will help to magnify their contribution and help them be more productive. And a successful company means a, a much more fun environment with better rewards. So how does it actually work? This is taken directly from a book that we actually use, which is called What the Heck is EOS? And it basically describes for employees what EOS does and how it is used in the business. So the system is a way a company organizes all of its human energy. So what we mean by that is it's about bringing all of your human energy together and actually maximizing it um, to achieve the best potential. So it's the way that the people in the organization meet, solve problems, plan, prioritize, follow processes, communicate, measure, structure, clarify roles, lead and manage. And it's hard to understand the operating systems of most companies because the leadership teams, they're not consistent in how they actually do the above. And so this inconsistency leads to poor communication, dysfunction, and employees feeling frustrated and confused about what the priorities actually are. And ultimately the company ever realized its potential. So what we're trying to do here is put some structure in place so that we have consistency, so people know exactly how they, they fit into the system, and they know exactly how their work affects what's done, uh, and they are laser sharp focused on what they need to do. So why EOS? Um, I fell in love with it. I, my little story here is that I actually have been running businesses pretty much my entire life. A lot of times for other people, privately owned businesses, like I said, I've been a, a GM and a CEO with up to 220 staff. I was the person who actually drove the vision that the board had to take the business forward. Um, and I really just love being involved in business. Uh, since then, I've been out on my own. I've been a coach for around about 16 years, I think it is now. So a coach, but also run my businesses as well as coaching. So on the side, I've always maintained running a business. And one of these businesses was actually an event center in Parnell in Auckland, New Zealand. And this event center was called The Common, The Entrepreneur's Playground. And it was a space that I had developed and designed to bring together entrepreneurs into an environment where they could actually connect with other entrepreneurs and get the support that they needed. And the space itself, the physical space, was a great place for hosting events, for product launches, for all the things that actually help strategy days, all the things that help an entrepreneurial business get off the ground. We had some amazing clients there like HubSpot and Facebook and other people, um, Microsoft, HP, come in and actually launch products from that environment. But one of the people who actually booked the space was a lady by the name of Fran and Francesca is actually um, one of, uh, she was the, uh, not quite sure what her title was, but she basically looked after the EOS 8-pack region with Daniel Davis, and she was in charge of organizing the launch into New Zealand. So they came into my event space, they launched EOS into New Zealand, and sadly, I actually could not make that day. Um, I was busy with a client, I couldn't actually attend the function, but I remember at the time, I saw the booking in our booking system, and it said EOS, and I knew about EO, the Entrepreneurs' Organization, which I've been a member of for three and a half years, and I thought, EO, EOS, there has to be something in this. And so I remember talking to Fran um, and saying, hey, what is this EOS stuff? And they gave me a couple of books. One of those was Get a Grip and the other was Traction. Now, I have to say, I read Get a Grip and I completely fell in love with it. Uh, to me, it just brought together everything I've learned through doing my MBA, through running businesses my entire life, um, through working as a coach at the ISAS, like all these things that I had sort of running around in my head. It brought it all together into a beautiful, really succinct, simple, pragmatic structure. And so that's kind of what, why I fell in love with EOS. And I put my hand up and said, yep, I'd love to train in this. And the next thing you know, I was on a plane and off doing my boot camp for EOS. So why this operating system? I suppose I've given you my version of why I think it, it, it's, a, um, it's a great system. But I also now know I'm now two and a half years into that journey. And I know that it's just a system that works. As I said, there's 110,000 companies around the world actually using it. And it's a real complete, simple, and powerful operating system, which helps companies grow to achieve their vision and goals more effectively. 
To be honest, EOS is specifically designed for a 10 to 250 person entrepreneur company that's open-minded and growth oriented. Um, and that's where it mostly has the, the, the most impact, but it also works for companies larger and smaller. There's just that real sweet spot that we find in EOS. And so in my journey of working with clients, we have, um, you know, started the proven process of EOS and gone through the, the system of, uh, learning how to strengthen the six key components. And what I've found is that businesses that actually take this on board and completely commit to this one operating system, put it in place, they actually achieve on average about 40% additional to the bottom line. I've got some beautiful stories about companies who achieved their 12 month goal in nine months. Um, I've got clients who have, you know, won awards. I've got clients that are, um, just happier. So often I work with family businesses, professional services, businesses. And this actually frees them up to have time to do a lot of things they love where before they're very bogged down in it. So it is about improving the business from a profitable and sustainable perspective, but it is also about freeing you up to have that EOS life that I talked about. So what do we have to do to implement EOS into our business? I'm not going to be able to take you through everything because as you can imagine, uh, this is about the, the overview of it, but I want to just give you a little bit of a sense of it. And then if you feel like this is something that you'd like to learn more about, there are some amazing resources on the EOS Worldwide website. So that's www.eosworldwide.com. Everything that I talk about is basically available for free as a download. Uh, there are books, there are tools, there are videos, you name it. They've just got such a massive amount of information they share. So by all means, go and have a look there. If you do eosworldwide.com forward slash Debra Chantry Taylor, Debra hyphen Chantry hyphen Taylor, um, you will actually also see my own website on there and see what I've been up to as well. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview um, and just share some stories about what I've learned through doing this. So the EOS model, and it's hard to do this without you actually seeing it, but it has this, it's based on this principle that every single business, no matter what business they're in, actually struggles with around about 136 common issues. And we know that if you can actually solve those issues at their root cause, then the company will become stronger. And these 136 issues basically fall into six key areas of the business. So we take a look at your business being at the center of this model. And what we do, if we look at these six key components and we go, how do we actually improve and strengthen each of these six key components with a goal of getting 80% strong in each of them, um, 100% obviously being utopia. And the six key components look a little bit like this. So the first one is around vision. And vision is really about, like I said, you've got, you've got the idea of what the vision is. You've got it in your heads, probably as a leadership team, you've got a fair understanding, but does everybody in the organization truly know what you are talking about? Do they really know where we're headed in the future? And what I've found through working with around about 18 companies now through this process is they've got a fair idea in their heads of where they're going, but honestly, it can't be articulated in a way that everybody can understand. And so what we need to do is we need to take this vision from the heads of the leadership team and put it into something that is easily shareable. And we do this using a, a document called the Vision Traction Organizer. And it's a simple two-page kind of business plan, if you like, the first page being all around vision and the second page about being traction, so the discipline, the accountability to actually achieve it. And we have eight key questions that we actually ask on that. I'm not going to go into great detail around them, but they're the things that, again, they exist in your mind. We just need to bring them out and make sure they're really, really clear. And they, they cover things like, you know, what are your core values? What's your core focus? What's your 10-year target or your big, hairy, audacious goal? What's your marketing strategy? What does your ideal client look like? What is your three-year picture? Can you describe for me how it looks and feels in your business in three years' time? And then bringing it down to the ground, we have the traction part, which is okay. In the next year, what are the three to seven most important things we have to achieve in this business to take us towards that three-year picture, that 10-year goal? And then breaking it down even further in the next 90 days, what are the three to seven rocks that we have to actually achieve to take us a little step forward towards those one-year goals? So again, you know, pop online, you can download the actual document from EOS Worldwide. Great, simple tool for bringing it out, but it's important that you actually engage with your leadership team to actually answer these questions, just to make sure you're on the same page. Because answering the questions is one part of it. We've got to then make sure that everybody in the organization actually understands what it is that we're talking about. And this is probably where most businesses fall over. 
we tend naturally as humans to overcomplicate things. We tend to um, want to do more. And so we always say less is more. We want three to seven key things, not 47 key things, because as every, everything is important, nothing is important. We also need to make sure we're using language that is appropriate for the people in our organization. So what I see happening often is that people want to uh, become, what's the right word, using sort of very um, almost what I would call academic terms or very highbrow terms, when in actual fact, they may not appeal to the people in the organization. So we need to use a language that is really consistent and that everybody can get. Even with our core values, we need to discover what they are and then make sure that we use a single word or phrase to actually encapsulate it and then describe what that means. So for example, we have got a core value of do what you say in EOS. That is the actual core value. The description around that is that, you know, you might deliver um, sometimes more than what you say, but you must make sure that you always deliver what you say. And for us in our organization, it's about, hey, we know that things happen and things change, but as long as you actually communicate the change, you're still doing what you say. So the vision part is, is something that's quite unique. I can't really give, you know, a, a lot of detail here for your business, but I know that when I work with certain companies, getting to that core focus and understanding where, why we exist and what we do and having it articulated in a really succinct, short, sharp, simple way that everybody can understand is just groundbreaking because then you can share it and people can actually buy into it. And I have an example of, of a professional services firm that I was working with. And there was a whole bunch of shareholders all sitting around the table when we're doing this vision building day. And they, they said to me, oh, look, we've already got this one page plan. We've already got our, our vision. We already know what our values are. I said, that's great. It's going to make my job so much easier. So come on, let, tell me what they are. And so I said, you know, let's start with the core values. So we went around the room and said, they've got nine of them. I was like, awesome. Let's see how we go with those nine core values. We went around the table and these are all shareholders, all people who have an active stake in the business, a financial stake in the business. And we could only get as far as pulling out three core values. And what had happened was it wasn't that the stuff that they were talking about weren't core values of the business, but they'd become overcomplicated. And we, what we managed to do was take those nine core values, distill them down into four core values, and then use the other words to describe what that really means. So we talk about what it does look like and what it doesn't look like, because shared by all means, we have to be living and breathing these core values and making sure that we're actually, you know, um, holding people accountable for that. So that's the vision components. There is no rocket science in here. You know, if people were sitting here thinking, oh, I'm dying to learn something really amazingly new, none of this stuff is particularly new. What it is, is about actually simplifying it down so we don't get overcomplicated, so we don't actually try to be too much to everybody. The next core component is all about people. And in very, very simple terms, this is part of the Jim Collins good to great, right? It's like having the right people on the bus. So in EOS, we talk about having the right people in the right seats. And what we mean by that is that the right people, they share our core values. They absolutely live and breathe our core values most of the time. Now, we've got to be a bit careful, right? Because uh, we are humans and we're all going to do something at some point, which means perhaps we don't actually uh, live out that core value. But we're talking about most of the time. So we use a thing called a people analyzer and we actually define our core values and we start to actually grade people on whether or not they're living by those core values. Now, if somebody is you know, flip-flopping a wee bit, it might just be that they've got something going on in their life which you can actually help them with. And as leaders, that's our role to help them. But we need to come, you know, find out what is going, truly going on for them and ask how we can help them to get back to mostly living by those core values. However, if you've got people who have got a whole bunch of negatives on there, people who are mostly not living those core values, you've got a real issue. And like it or not, these people, the people who are the wrong people in the organization, they need to go. They will become that rotten apple in the organization that will just affect everybody else. It's a difficult topic for me to actually share too much because obviously this has got a massive impact in terms of the way the business is run. But I have seen certain businesses where at the beginning of this proven process, we've started off with a team of 11 people. And by the time we finish in the leadership team, by the time we finish, we're down to four or five and in actual fact even then a couple of those have actually changed from the original people so it isn't a bad thing if somebody doesn't share your core values in fact I think the sooner you let them go the better because they're going to be happy somewhere else they're not happy with you either so it has to be a two-way thing if they're not sharing your core values they're not going to work for you but at the same time they're probably desperately unhappy so we need to free these people up to go and find something they truly love 
The second part of it is around having people in the right seats. And this is where it becomes a wee bit of a challenge for a lot of people because we build a structure of a business and we call it an organizational chart and it happens over time, but we don't regularly review it. What tends to happen, and I've seen this happen a lot in, in businesses, is that, you know, somebody moves immediately go off and we hire somebody else to fill that place. Or we have a family member or somebody, we go, oh, they'd be perfect for that role. And we pop them in there, even though we haven't really clearly defined what that role is. So the most important thing about the right seats is we actually have to develop structure first, people second. What is the absolute ideal structure to make this business achieve its goals in the next 12 months. And this means going back to the whiteboard, going back to the beginning, blank sheet of paper and going, hey, if we had an opportunity to completely redesign this, what would it look like in this um, organization? Who are those sort of, you know, what, what is the right structure? And then how do we ensure that we get the right people in those seats to deliver on that? Again, going back to the EOS life principles, we talk about doing what you love with people you love. When you have the right structure and you start to put the right people into those right seats, that is when you find people are doing most of the time what they love. And this makes a significant difference to the business. So you've got the issue with potentially having the wrong people. That is pretty dangerous. But also having somebody who might well share your core values, but does not, is not in a seat they can actually deliver on really, really well. They're going to have a, a, probably an even bigger impact on the business. So hopefully we can move them on to some, somewhere else in the business where they can truly do what they love. But if we can't, we still have to let them go. Because if this person isn't performing in their role, if they're not doing what is required of them, they're not, they've got, we call it an accountability chart. Uh, if they're not doing what they're accountable for, they're going to upset other people in the business who actually are. And so as a consequence, it's really important that we have not only the right people, but they have to be in the right seats. Like I said, with a bit of luck, you might find another seat they absolutely love. But if not, then sadly, they have to move on to. And again, it's for the greater good. Um, they will find somewhere where they absolutely flourish and life will be better for them as well as for you. The third component is around data. And I always joke about this. It's like I've seen so much data in my time. So working in corporate for a number of years, working in our own businesses, you know, we often measure things either because it's easy or it makes us feel good or we've just always done it this way. I remember at Tower, we used to get these reports that would come through, great big top matrix printed reports. That's how old um, the technology was in Tower. But, you know, they would just come through. It's like, well, why do I get these? And nobody could really tell me. It was just we've always had this report. Data in the EOS world is about actually what is the data that really makes a significant difference to the business. I always say, imagine you're sitting on a beautiful island somewhere. Now we can travel again. That's possible. And you're sitting there and you're sitting there drinking your margarita and the little cabana boy comes across or girl in whatever um, suits and he brings you a sheet of paper. And on this sheet of paper, there are some numbers, somewhere between five and 15 numbers. And there are 13 weeks worth of information of these numbers. He hands it over to you and he goes, Mrs. Chantry Taylor, I have brought you your numbers. And you should be able to look at that scorecard and actually say, wow, things are looking pretty good. I'm staying for another week. Get me another margarita. I'm going to really chill out and enjoy my holiday. Or you might look at it and go, actually, we've got an issue. Not sure it's time to get back on the plane yet, but I need to have a conversation with the leadership team and find out where things are at. So your scorecard consists of a limited number of measurables that really help you understand where the business is going. And it needs to be a mixture of both leading and lagging indicators. And what I mean by that is it's all very well kind of going revenue, revenue, um, you know, whether or not we have how many sales we've made, how many errors. They're all, they're all past history um, metrics, which means that you can't do much about them. So what are the leading indicators? Think about things like, you know, how many proposals have you sent out? How many client meetings have you had? Um, as an example, if you're looking at sort of customer service, how many complaints have you had coming in? Because that will likely lead to an issue later down the track. How many, how much out of stock have you got if you're in an e-commerce business or an importing business? How much stock have you got that's out of stock? Because we know that will lead to issues for that other track. So having that mixture of leading and lagging indicators just means you can have a, a snapshot of the business looking over 13 weeks so you can see trends and issues before they actually arise. And then you can then have the discussion around what can we do to change that. So data is about having a scorecard and having measurables. And it's about ultimately, if you wanted utopia, every single person in the organization having a measurable they are accountable for. So this could be a receptionist who has to pick up a phone call within three rings. It could be how long it takes us to respond to an email with it from a client. 
It could be around the number of complaints we will accept. It could be around net promoter score. There's a whole range of things you can measure, but every single person, no matter where they are in the organization, should actually have a measurable or two that they're responsible for. The fifth component is around issues. And this is the one that I think I like the most, because let's face it, we know that every single company has issues. If you think your company hasn't got issues, I'm going to suggest you're probably doing something wrong. And I like to think of EOS as being like this massive spotlight that comes in and it shines around your entire business and highlights every single issue that you had. Now, even if you recognize you've got issues, if you don't do something about them, they're just going to keep recurring and keep causing issues, further issues from them. So within the EOS, we have two tools that we use. The first is an issues list. Sounds really simple, sounds really basic, but having a list of every single thing that is an issue, short term and long term that the company needs to deal with. And we do this through, you know, um, raising this at our level 10 meetings to get issues out of people. But also you can use apps and software. You can have a physical list on the wall on a white, doesn't matter, but just keeping them somewhere. So I wake up in the morning, 2 a.m. I suddenly go, oh, there's something we have to do. OK, I'll pop it into the app and I know that it's there for the next um, level 10 meeting that we have. But we also have to think about issues as not always being negative. So issues could potentially be opportunities. They could be things that you actually need to take advantage of. Um, so they're not always necessarily a negative. It's anything that comes out of our SWOT analysis. You know, what are our weaknesses? What are our strengths? What are our opportunities? What are the threats? These become the issues both short term and long term. And then we use our meeting structure, which we'll come to shortly, to actually make sure that we actually get these issues up in front of ourselves and start to work through how we solve them. And solving issues, we use a tool called the Issues Solving Track. It's very, very simple. I've got some videos. I've put some links in, the, in this um, podcast you can have a look at. But IDS means that we're actually looking at, first of all, identifying the issue. And when I say identifying it, we need to have a list of the issues that we've got. We first of all need to prioritize them. What is the most important issue on this list? And make sure we solve them in order of importance. The next thing is identifying the real issue. So this is where I, being a curious child who always asked why, 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 we have to go, ah, oh, so you tell me you've got an issue with this. Let's explore that. Tell me why. Tell me what. Tell me how. So a classic example was one of my clients came to a meeting and they said, we've got an issue with operations capacity. I was like, oh, okay. That's interesting. Tell me what that issue is. Well, we don't have enough people in operations to actually deliver all the products and services we need to deliver. Um, and so we're really struggling. I said, oh, okay. When did this issue start? Oh, it was about six months ago. Oh, why? What happened? Oh, when COVID hit, we've had issues getting product delivered from overseas. And so as a consequence, we used to just, you know, supply pretty much just in time and had some spare stock on hands. So we always had, we could always fulfill orders. But now what we're finding is we can't fulfill those orders because we've got stock that hasn't arrived yet. When the stock does come in, we have to put it into people who ordered it, in, you know, in order of who ordered it. And so there's all this additional work that needs to be done. It's like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, um, why is that such a manual process? Oh, well, our computer system isn't set up to actually handle it. Oh, I see. So in actual fact, it's not really an operations capacity issue, is it? Isn't it more of a people and process issue? Uh, well, sorry, technology and process issue. Like, yeah, I suppose it is. Okay. So then we go into the second part of um, IDS. So we've identified the real issue now. The second part is around discussing it. And discussing it means, you know, what are all the different possible solutions? This is the bit that a lot of clients find quite hard. As human beings, and, and particularly men, but not always, we want to naturally jump in and actually provide a solution. So what will often happen is we go, yay, we finally got to the real issue. <laughs> Sometimes that can take some time, let me tell you. Then we go, right, let's discuss it. And so rather than jumping straight to a solution, let's discuss all of the possible ways we could do that. So in the example that I just gave, there's a couple of options that we kind of talked about. One of them was, hey, we could employ, employ more staff. And let's face it, an, an ops person, 50, 60K a year, we could employ a couple of extra people and that would make all that work go away. The second option is we could look at actually adjusting the software. Could we make the software do what needs to be done in this process? And we had a discussion around that, worked out how long it would take, what it would look like. Um, and there was a couple of other kind of opportunities that we could actually discuss. So we came, discussed it all and realized that actually for two to three weeks worth of work on the system, we could actually solve the issue once and for all, and we wouldn't have to employ new staff. 
And so that became the solve. And from a solve, a whole bunch of to-dos come from it. So to-dos are things to do in the next seven days. So the to-dos are, hey, we need to cost out what it's going to take. We need to make sure we've got technical specs for the delivery of this particular piece of software. Uh, we then need to engage with somebody to actually do it, test it, get it out. So there's the things that you know, need to be done. It becomes something we work through. So that's the issues part of the, um, the EOS model. The next part is around process. And this is really simple. I can't do much here on a podcast. It's a very visual thing. But most people uh, want to document all of their processes. And they spend such a long time documenting it. But nobody is actually following it. So the EOS model says there's two parts to process. First of all, document your core processes. What are the absolute processes your company needs to do to keep going every single day? Make sure these are documented in a really simplistic way that anybody can follow and then have it followed by all. And this is all around if we can actually start to get some consistency in what we're doing, then we can start to see where things are falling over and then we can monitor, we can train, we can measure, we can adjust depending on how this actually goes. So most people want to rush in and get a complete operating manual for every single thing, SOPs for Africa, and yet they haven't actually got the basics right. So get the basics documented, get people doing it in a consistent way, and then start to see where you can make those adjustments. That's about as simple as it gets. Processes, core processes, documented Pareto principle, 20% will produce 80% of the results and followed by all, which means that everybody is actually following the, the process you have documented. And finally, the sixth component is around traction. And this I've kind of alluded to a wee bit in, in, throughout this whole talk is that actually, you know, vision without traction is hallucination. So how do we actually instill this discipline, this accountability, this focus to make sure we're actually doing it? And there are two components to this. The first is around having rocks. And rocks are 90-day pieces of work that people have to do within a 90-day period to move us towards our one-year plan. So everybody in the organization has some rocks that they're focused on. And finally, we have to have a good meeting pulse. And so meeting pulse is around ensuring that we have a regular weekly meeting for every single department that follows the same agenda. It's on the same day, same time, starts on time, finishes on time, and follows the same agenda. And we're going to be talking a lot more about those meetings in one of the um, future podcasts. So tune in for that. We're going to teach you how to run world-class level 10 meetings. But it's really important that we have that regular uh, departmental meetings, so that information flows up and down the organization. And there's a leadership team then having the quarterly and annual planning sessions as well to ensure that we actually have um, a regular meeting cadence. And that's it. That's the EOS model. It's as simple as working on those six key components, strengthening them, aiming for that 80% strong, strong in each of those six components with 100% being the utopia. And when you work with an EOS implementer, we follow a proven process to make sure that we actually start to get traction first before we go into that vision stuff. So there's a certain way that we actually help the teams to, to, to put some tools in place they can start using immediately before we actually get into the much more in-depth stuff. That is my quick overview of what the heck is EOS. I hope that you found that helpful. Once again, lots of information on eosworldwide.com. You can download tools, books, uh, videos, blogs, you know, lots, lots of information. I, I highly recommend you look that up. And if you'd like any more information, of course, you can also get in contact with me. My email address is possibly the longest email address in the world these days. So it is Debra, D-E-B-R-A dot chantry c-h-a-n-t-r-y hyphen taylor at eosworldwide.com deborah dot chantry hyphen taylor at eosworldwide.com i'd be really happy to actually sit down with you take you through the eos model and show you how it's going to work on your business um, as I said, I'm currently on holiday, so I pre-recorded all of these little podcasts for you. The next one, we're going to be talking about the EOS life and what that looks like. Then we're going to be talking about the, how to lead world-class level 10 meetings, talking about how you manage and maximize your energy as an entrepreneur. And finally, I've decided to do the fifth one on, around some tips for managing through the recessions that you not only um, survive, but you actually thrive on the other side. I actually see recessions as being a massive opportunity um, to do some pretty special things. So I'm going to be taking you through some of those things that I think you could be doing to make sure you come out the other side absolutely thriving. Hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. Look forward to sharing my next lot of information in the next podcast. I've also got some great guests lined up for when I come back. So I will be back on the 6th of September, which means that the following week we're back into guest podcasts. 
Hope you have a fantastic day and look forward to talking again soon. Thanks again for joining us on Better Business, Better Life with me, your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. If you enjoyed what you heard, then please subscribe to this podcast and let us help you to get what you want out of business and life. Each week we release a new short episode which will give a success story and three takeouts to put into action immediately. These will help you take your business from good to great. The podcast is also supported by free resources, templates and useful tools which you can find at deborahchantrytaylor.com. I am a trained entrepreneurial leadership and business coach, a professional EOS implementer and an established business owner myself. I work with established businesses to help them get what they want. Feel free to contact me if you'd like to have a chat about how I might be able to help you or if you'd like to join me as a guest on this podcast. Thanks again to NZ Audio Editors for producing this podcast. See you on the next episode.